CrossFit may be cooked. You've just bloomin' give me a bit of heart attack. Is CrossFit dying? Yes, CrossFit is dying. And he legitimately says that he used the sport of CrossFit to make money. Simply put, it is a few decisions made by either Greg Glassman or Jeff Kane, the CEO at the time. And it is Matt Fraser and Rich Froning. We got back after the CrossFit Games and it was like a month or so later, me and Heber were traveling around the world doing interviews, trying to produce the 2018 documentary. And I think I was in Brazil and I got a phone call and they were like, we no longer need you to be employed at this time. And I was just like, you're gonna fire me over the phone after 10 years of being with this company? CrossFit may be cooked, or a translation of that, it might be on a downturn or permanent downturn since right around 2018. And if we look at Google Trends, thanks to my pal, Craig Ritchie. You've just bloomin' give me a bit of heart attack. Is CrossFit dying? So basically I did my own digging. First off in the Mayhem Nation email, it said CrossFit has been a game changer in the world of fitness, but it has been shifting we found something intriguing. Google searches for CrossFit and CrossFit affiliated gyms have declined in 2023 compared to previous years. Fewer people are seeking CrossFit related content and information whilst more CrossFit gyms are closing their doors than new ones opening. Negative growth, a trend that's concerning. And while searches for CrossFit since July 2013 have been on a down. The search term CrossFit has steadily gone down or there's been a trend uh, for it to go down since about 2013. And there was a steep cliff at 2018. Beyond that, Craig also mentions uh, that there aren't really any names that are as powerful pushing the, uh, the name of CrossFit along. If you look at the old school athletes, you know, like the OGs, people call them the OGs a lot of the time, or the ones that have been in the sport for quite a recognizable amount of time performed well, right? Jason Kalipa, 470,000 followers. Matt Fraser, 2.4 million. Dan Bailey, 602,000 followers. Noah Olsen, 846,000. Katrin, 1.7 million. Tia, 2 million. Brooke Entz, 1.5 million. Chris Spieler, 249,000. Josh Bridges, 792,000. Annie, 1.4 million. Rich Froning, 1.5 million. Laura Horvath, 431K. Lauren Fisher, 1.1 million. Pat Vellner, 630,000. That's just to, you know, they're like people that have been in the sport for a decent whack of time, but um, were there during that blow up when CrossFit had the most interest. Think about it. Their followings are pretty huge. Compare that to what I would call the new school athletes. And of these, probably the biggest names that I'm gonna say are Mal O'Brien, 739,000. Danielle Brandon, 711,000. Emma Lawson, 334,000. Arguably those three are the three biggest names in the sport right this second and none of them break that million barrier like CrossFit athletes have in the past. Craig then talks about his YouTube performance over time. So if you look at all the statistics, yes, CrossFit is dying. And uh, it's had a little bit of a spike after COVID, but it has not come back to life. The games this year was actually lower than the games last year. Um, I saw that with my videos over the last couple of years. This past year, we had the best access, made 40, 50 minute episodes, and I thought they were incredible behind the scenes. And I put so much effort into them and they didn't do as well as previous videos, which like, it does hurt, but um, you just gotta be proud of what you put out, you know? And uh, it's just because of the interest at the moment in the sport. And also people may be bored of me, which I fully get. This is the one that hits home probably the most. I cannot, for the life of me, put out videos that compete with my old videos numbers. And I think this is just how it goes for many YouTube channels, unless you really push things into a, a more cinematic kind of Mr. Beast style video uh, similar to the likes of Jesse James West or Will Tennyson, sometimes even Jeff Nippard. And this might be one of the biggest reasons that, that I'm just kind of thinking of now as to why CrossFit is on this downturn is that it's just getting boring to people. I don't know. I don't know. That's, you know, if that is following suit with Craig's channel. Now let's get into Andrew Hiller's opinion on this because he did do a pretty good video on it. Tia Toomey. You can also say somebody like Matt Fraser who went on a global platform. He went on Joe Rogan. I've listened to the thing on Spotify a handful of times and he legitimately says that he used the sport of CrossFit to make money. He talked down upon the trainers at CrossFit affiliates. He didn't do anything to help the brand while he was on Joe Rogan after having just won the CrossFit games. There's a Sevon podcast somewhere 
where Greg Glassman says that he spent millions of dollars so that Matt Fraser could win hundreds of thousands. He goes, yeah, I could. it's like the worst investment of all time. Why would I spend millions of dollars so that he could make a little bit of money? And that's what he would do. He would take all of the money from the Open to put on the CrossFit game so that Matt Fraser could make hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. He's made millions of dollars over his CrossFit games winnings, and what did he do with it? He started HWPO, his own brand. What did Tia Toomey do with her winnings? She started Proven, and you guess what? Guess what, Greg? This is your fault too, because in 2017, when you get rid of the media team, the media team is the people who would ship these people out to go make the road to the games where Ben Smith is doing all these workouts, and he's doing it. Ben Smith versus Matt Fraser versus Rich Froning versus Katrin versus the Eslanda girls. Remember those road to the games things that were put on by Heber and Mars? Well, guess what? Heber and Mars are now doing their own thing over on the Buttery Bros. To further encapsulate Hiller's point here, uh, that he's trying to make throughout this, you know, 31 minute video is that a lot of the stuff that some of the individuals in the CrossFit games didn't do was promote the brand of CrossFit, literally the red shirt uh, seminar staff type of stuff um, that, you know, had been happening in years prior. And there's definitely some sort of validity there. But I, you know, once you make a sport professional, once you make it so that someone can make a living and make a lot of money doing it, if there's any potential for that, Matt saw that, nothing, absolutely nothing in his mind uh, was more important or even relevant whatsoever than winning the CrossFit Games. So he actually didn't care about the uh, methodology, didn't care about promoting the brand whatsoever, just wanted to win. And if you look at any other sport, that is the case. So it's really difficult to kind of ask this of people to to promote this brand of CrossFit when in all reality, they're using their likeness whenever they get to. Uh, they're, they get to use this as much as they want um, to maybe ask athletes to promote the brand outside of it. I don't know how well that's going to go over. Also, you know, CrossFit can reach out to these people and just be like, hey, we're going to fly you in. We're just going to have you promote it. I mean, they had done that with some of the red shirts before when, you know, the, the people who were in the seminar staff were actually competing in the game. So we had people promoting the brand and competing in the games at the same time. Look, I don't want to paraphrase Hiller, but it's a 31 minute video. Okay. And he gets really fired up. Um, but I want to deliver my opinion on why CrossFit may be cooked. Simply put, it is a few decisions made by either Greg Glassman or Jeff Kane, the CEO at the time. What I have gathered from people that have, were working in HQ, which was in Santa Cruz, you know, across CrossFit's entire existence basically thus far, was that there, there seemed to be like team games and team methodology. And you had to kind of pick which one. Uh, and what was amazing to me anecdotally was seeing both of them work in tandem and this explosive uh, source for content came partially Savan Matosian who is you know he's pretty prevalent in the space of CrossFit on YouTube uh, but you know it was even further accentuated by the road to the games and these documentaries that were done by the people we now know as the buttery bros Heber Cannon, Marston Sawyer and Julian Marquez these guys created incredible pieces of content completely for free off the backs of uh, these Netflix movies or iTunes movies, whatever, wherever they were streaming. Now they did all of this and it just, it, it felt so explosive. Was anyone watching this around during those times in CrossFit? I'm talking 2013 to uh, 2018 where it just seemed like it's just so powerful. You know, um, there there was one video that I want to be able to find, and it is Matt Fraser in Vermont doing the open workout and Rich Froning in uh, Cookville doing the open workout. And just the intensity, the pacing of that video, it was like I could just watch that for pre-workout and be like, I want to go work out. And, and that continued over time and over time. And then, boom, it just stopped. And if we look at the, the metrics of CrossFit's YouTube channel, it is not even close. Marston, my boy. What's up, dude? Things changed rapidly. Like you guys, it, it was seemed like this huge success story, 50 to 100 million views, all marketing CrossFit, all getting people to get uh, to, to join CrossFit. But 
something changed. What were those changes? Well, just to give you a little bit of history, I remember going to the CrossFit Games in 2010. That was the first games I went to. There was probably like half the seats were full. And then they signed with Reebok. The very next year, it was like the whole stadium was almost full. And it was becoming more professionalized. People were having jerseys now. Their athletes were getting contract deals through different sponsors. And then by 2012, they're having to like build up extra grandstands to fill like the demand for how many people wanted to be at this event. And that really kind of grew until we got to the point where we were like making documentaries in 2014, 2015, 2016. Now you're getting this on a global level of seeing this on Netflix and you're seeing it on Hulu. So now it's getting a lot more eyeballs than it was before. And I feel like that's where it was like kind of reaching its peak. And then everybody that I worked with at CrossFit and over the over the years, it was like we were all stoked because like it was it was working. All of this hard work was paying off. That kind of culminated at the end of 2018 is really when things started changing. They were going to make these giant shifts and giant layoffs and everything. So there was a lot of uncertainty in the offices around that time because nobody really knew why. Because everybody is looking around, they're like, what we did was good. This was successful. Why would they change everything? It doesn't make any sense. We got back after the CrossFit Games, and it was like a month or so later, me and Heber were traveling around the world doing interviews, trying to produce the 2018 documentary. And I think I was in Brazil, and I got a phone call, and they were like, we no longer need you to be employed at this time. And I was just like, you're going to fire me over the phone after 10 years of being with this company? And they didn't really give much of an explanation. They were just saying that they're going in a different direction. It's their company. They can do what they want with it. But it would definitely came as a surprise and it came as a shock, not just to me, but like the whole community at that time. Did he say that you were too successful too fast? We, we talked to Jeff Kane, who was at the time when we got fired, he was the CEO, but I think he was just kind of the guy that Greg hired to make all the changes that Greg wanted. Because I know that Greg wasn't a big fan of the sport of CrossFit and he wanted to focus more on the actual methodology of CrossFit, the everyday people in the gyms getting fit, which has been a great part of the success. But I feel like the tip of the spear athletes is the real reason why people really latched onto the sport because they look like superhumans on ESPN and in these documentaries and it inspired people to want to go out and join a CrossFit gym and get in shape and Maybe they're not going to get into the same results of Rich Froning and Matt Fraser and all those at the time. And each year we'd go to the CrossFit Games and it'd be sold out, standing room only, and everybody would be very supportive of the athletes. And so I felt like although CrossFit didn't have like a marketing budget, that this was the marketing budget. It was this big event, this big spectacle mm. that got everybody, everybody like turned in, to, turned on to watch this thing. And everybody had their favorite athlete, diehard fans. And it seems uh, that the times are starting to shift. I don't know if that's because like the hype and the craze of CrossFit has kind of died down since those days. I don't know if that's also has to do with them changing the season every year and it becoming a little bit harder to follow as a like casual spectator of the sport, you know? So look, we have all of these different factors as to why, you know, we see the trend of CrossFit not being as prevalent anymore. We see all of these things that that could be potential reasons for it. But we're in a place now where I, it feels as though CrossFit is kind of just like, oh shit, we got to figure out how to market again. So we're going to get a bunch of people from like Twitter and LinkedIn and whatever. And we're going to try and do this marketing that just seems very forced and not as exciting. Hiller has been making endless commentary about this in the last few weeks. So definitely check out his videos. But you know, the solution might be that there is no solution. You just kind of have to keep on continuing moving, hope that maybe some superstars come up and maybe it was just CrossFit's trajectory to kind of slow down a little bit. Also, a big part of this is just nostalgia. I think a lot of, we're, we're reaching a new era of CrossFit, we're reaching a new era of Olympic weightlifting and we just think back on all of the great times like every other boomer does when they talk about the 60s, 70s, what have you. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, why CrossFit may be going for a downturn, if they're gonna pop back up somehow and become more professionalized. Just let me know, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.